It's Mimister's voice. As you can tell, I'm now wearing my usual avatar. This one is a CCS mascot known as Mofu. Not so. <laughs> anyway, so getting back to the video now. Non-standard apparatus. There's a reason why it's called non-standard apparatus. That's because not everybody can access lab equipment. In some cases, it's either prohibitively expensive or in some cases, it's partially outlawed. Like, I'm, I'm not going to say it's illegal to, like, you know, obtain it. No, it just, you can't buy it in some places, which is kind of weird. Anyway, look no further because there are a lot of alternatives that do the exact same thing. There's also cases where this approach is actually a lot safer than using glassware. One example is whenever you need to boil some sodium hydroxide, if you were to use glassware, the bumping can get you, the etching can get you. But you know, if you've studied, you know, chemistry, which most people, I'm pretty sure you've done, you realize that most metals, except maybe aluminum and copper, or some metals, don't really get affected by sodium hydroxide. So you can, in fact, use something like a steel pot and you would have been just fine. You wouldn't have to worry about bumping because it's not going to crack a metal. You don't have to worry about none of that. You can just boil away and, and get your dried product and be fun with it. That's it. Simple. Okay, so we're going to talk about alternative glassware. What's behind me are these bamboo lid pasta containers. These things are always made of borosilicate. They're also very thin, very light, and very reliable when it comes to boiling liquids. They also come in a 5-liter capacity, and it's very easy to convert them into a jacketed stirred reactor just by putting a larger plastic jar over them, epoxying it shut, and adding inlets and outlet hoses. They're pretty much the OG of alternative glassware. Another alternative glassware I know are these lock and lock oven glass bowls now these are slightly thicker which means they're slightly more durable i've dropped some of these and they were completely fine you shouldn't by the way but anyway these are also really good the only problem is they're shallow bowls and they're more expensive so that's a minus for them but at least they're not cringe wrecks or pyrex because that stuff just shatters no matter what now because they replace it with soda lime glass Meanwhile, their competitors are all using borosilicate. So why on earth would you buy Pyrex in 2023? Anyway, glass tea kettles are another alternative, but I would not trust them because I haven't used them a lot except for once or twice. They're kind of okay. In fact, I think one of my longest surviving alternative glassware is a glass tea kettle. I used it a lot to boil sulfuric acid and all sorts of things, and it's doing just fine. Of course, I left it behind. But these are pretty much your alternatives to borosilicate. Well, they are technically borosilicate. I mean alternatives to lab glassware. They're made of the same stuff. They're differently shaped. They're for different uses, but they all work the same. But really, for the convenience of uh, a nice cylindrical shape, I'd use these bamboo lid containers and there are some tea kettles that aren't really kettle shaped but more pitcher shaped. These are really good alternatives for beakers. They usually come in a 2 liter capacity and they already have a pour spout so you can easily pour stuff out of them. However, they may have a metal rim that, that holds the handle but I mean it's not like that's going to corrode easily if you don't spill it. You know so you don't have to worry about that at all anyway these are the types of alternative glassware so happy hunting guys all right so the next thing i'm going to talk about is non-glasswares boiling containers these are your ceramic pots your steel pots and in some cases aluminum pots and ceramic casseroles although i don't recommend the the ceramic casseroles they're actually pretty bad they crack a lot. I never use them. I used to, but they suck. Aluminum pots. You might think aluminum is such a reactive metal. It can't possibly be used in chemistry, but you'd be wrong. 
nitric acid does not attack aluminum enough in any appreciable way to produce the nitrate. In fact, you're just going to produce a passivating layer of oxide even while it's boiling in there, and that's about it. It's very useful for anything that involves boiling nitric acid or uh, chlorate cell liquids, If you, after you've adjusted the pH, of course, because in fact, aluminum is the best thing to boil your sodium chlorate liquor in. It's better than steel, because steel kind of corrodes from it, but aluminum only passivates so yes aluminum pots they're they're miracle in some cases thanks to aluminum oxide you got steel pots next steel pots are good in high alkaline environments so if your reaction mixture is highly alkaline you can use stainless steel or just even other kinds of steel pots without much issue so for this I would use a steel pot like even boiling if you didn't change the pH of your chlorate cell afterwards you can use a steel pot to boil it although it may leach chromium it has happened that's why I consider funnily enough aluminum pots to be far more useful than steel pots but they still have their uses like with highly alkaline materials that don't have bleach in them anyway the next thing is ceramic coated pots when you can have steel pots but without the hassle of it being eaten away or leaching out chromium these things however cannot handle acidic mixtures very readily these things are good for neutral to alkaline so ceramic coated pots i would say are a great alternative for lots of things but I keep an aluminum pot for those specialized applications. Now the reason why we're I'm talking about this is unlike their glass counterparts, you don't have to worry about bumping. That stuff doesn't happen as easily with these. This bumping will get you. It's it's really annoying. I hate that. And it doesn't happen with steel pots. And even if it does, you're not gonna crack a metal. So these things are perfect for those uh, use cases. Now we're going to talk about different ways to measure parameters in your experiment that you can get outside of lab equipment. Kitchen thermometers are a lifesaver. I've used them in my thesis. They work. You know, it's like you need something a lot higher than 100 Celsius. Like we're talking maybe 200, 300. And you realize that these shitty mercury thermometers aren't really a thing you want to be using because... You know, most of them don't go that high and even if they do you're you're sweating half the time you're gonna worry that it's gonna hit your magnetic stir and it's all over now if you're worried about corrosion no problem just just wrap the ends in teflon tape and it will withstand whatever reaction conditions you have in your experiment so kitchen thermometers these digital ones are really great now another good measuring equipment is the multimeter Multimeters are useful. They're, they're cheap. You don't have to get the expensive ones. The cheap ones are good. You can measure lots of current with them. Like you, when you combine them with an inline shunt, which I talked about in a previous video, you can measure hundreds of amps with a $3 multimeter. So that's a good thing. And inline shunts are also the best kinds of shunts. You've made them yourself and you're confident about their accuracy. If you're confident about yours anyway soil ph meters these this is another piece of equipment it's just you stick it in some mud and it will read the ph now i haven't really used these for you know other things besides measuring the ph of soil but i've heard from others that they work decently well so if you are tired of using those ph strips you can just use these things as well. These digital meters will give you more resolution anyway if you can calibrate them. Calibrating these pH meters are very simple. I mean, they're made so that anyone can use them. So yeah, soil pH meters. They might cost a little bit, but they're pretty good. Heating devices. Now, sometimes you need precision more than anything. It's like, you know... You want to heat things, but this lab hot plate costs $400. Why 
well. Just get this for anything below a hundred Celsius. Just get the water bath and sous vide cooker. Sous vide cookers are actually really good. They reach very precise temperatures for whatever you need them to. You can use them as a water bath dryer. You can use them for a particular reaction that needs, I don't know, 70, 60, 85 degrees Celsius. And if you need just bulk heating, you can also use an aquarium heater that's half inserted to get temperatures beyond uh, 35 Celsius. You can go up to 60 Celsius depending on the level that you insert it in. I use these, by the way. Aquarium heaters are very useful. They're robust and they won't break easily. Rice cookers. Now, rice cooker does not go beyond 100 degrees Celsius. So it's really good in certain applications like steam distillation. <clears throat> when you're out of water, it just shuts off. Put more water, start it again. And you can easily modify it so that you can inject steam into whatever you're, you know, putting it through. And, you know, unlike your lab hot plates, you can put a lot more power in a rice cooker. These things have as much wattage as your kitchen hot plates, about 2 kilowatts. So, they're really good. Don't underestimate rice cookers. Hair dryers. Hair dryers are like nerfed versions of a heat gun. They are pretty much a heat gun, except they only have like two settings. And I use these sometimes, but I prefer getting a heat gun. Microwave furnaces. Microwave synthesis is a new and emerging, or <clears throat> rather, emerging tech in the amateur sphere. And it's also been used in the professional sphere. Now, these things, microwave furnaces can reach temperatures of 2,000 degrees. And you literally just need a kitchen microwave, a, a bunch of fire bricks, and just jump start it with a bit of aluminum wire into your mixture. And it will just get started and you can get on cooking. It's like kind of like this weird mix between an, a plasma arc furnace and a sintering thing. This, this is very useful. I recommend you build a microwave furnace if you're on a budget and you don't have, you know, the resources to make a proper electric furnace and you only want to do very small scale experiments. Microwave furnaces. Now, we're going to talk about heat exchangers and cooling. Lab refrigerator, everyone must have one. But do not store low boiling point flammable solvents in them because they have been known to be disagreeable and sometimes detonate. Thanks to people putting diethyl ether in them. Don't do that. And if you want, you know, more cooling and you don't really want to keep using an ice pack whenever you do distillation or any other operation, you can get a radiator from a water dispenser or mini fridge. And you can either pass water or whatever other coolant liquid. In fact, that's actually a bonus because if you're able to use the uh, refrigerant in there and you get the whole thing intact, you can build a cryogenic trap for, you know, vacuum distillation. You could also make cold finger for vacuum sublimation. So radiators, they're very useful, whether they're filled with water or they're filled with Freon or whatever they use nowadays. They're very useful. You can do so much with them. Jacketed reactors. I think I've already covered this, but a jacketed reactor and a sous vide cooker is the best means of getting a temperature controlled continuous stirred tank reactor useful for whatever experiment you want. Like I said, you're combining both fine cooking and fine chemistry done with the weirdest materials on earth. Anyway, water ice bath. I mean, even in standard stuff, they use this. But it's technically non-standard. There's nothing standard about a water bath. So yeah, let's move on. Well, looks like they're in more. There's a lot more videos on the, these topics. I didn't get into the specifics of each type and a few more other nuances. But this is the general overview. It's not the... Uh, 
specific in-depth talk about the many different types of thermocouples that you can get from AliExpress and how to DIY them up and the difference between why some people use thermocouples and thermistors you know if, if your experiment involves magnetic fields you don't want to use a thermocouple is one example so magnetic stirrer ah anyway that's it for today see you later y'all